what I want to discuss with you is a new system for flood forecasting that has um, just become operational across the country and, and in Texas as well. So uh, I want to uh, first of all acknowledge a number of colleagues uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, the collaboration with the City of Austin, the National Weather Service, the Texas Division of Emergency Management and a number of other National Science Foundation and so on. So how did this happen? Uh, there is a new national water centre that's opened on the Tuscaloosa campus of the University of Alabama. And that's not an artist's rendition, that's the real thing. And why Tuscaloosa, Alabama? Thank you, Senator Shelby. Hey, $50 million just fell out of the sky. Uh, Tuscaloosa's his hometown. Uh, but what this uh, new national water centre did was create an opportunity to think about hydrology in a new way across the continental United States. Uh, I participated in the first meeting that was held there, which was in May of 2014, and you can see the rather large building here, and it was going to take several years for the federal staff to ramp up, and so I suggested why don't we engage the academic community in working with the National Water, uh, Weather Service to uh, build a new national water model for the nation. And so that came to be called the National Flood Interoperability Experiment, uh, and it is a partnership between the National Weather Service and the academic community that goes through the National Science Foundation. And there have been summer institutes for about 40 graduate students uh, each summer in 2014 and 2015, where they've been working for seven weeks at a time uh, to help build a national water model for the country. In 2015, the first of these summer institutes, we developed a prototype national model using Stampede which is our supercomputer at the University of Texas at Austin. That water tank there is right outside my office, 1.2 million gallons, put 60,000 gallons an hour through Stampede. And with that, we demonstrated that it's possible to calculate the flow across all the streams and rivers of the country in 10 minutes, coast to coast, in 10 minutes. And nobody thought that was even possible before we started, but we proved that it, it could be done. In doing that, we made use of a national geospatial information infrastructure called the NHD+. NHD stands for National Hydrography Dataset, and the plus version of it means the integration of the land system with the water system. It took 10 years to develop the National Elevation Dataset, Hydrography Dataset, Land Cover Dataset, and Watershed Boundary Dataset. That took place between 1995 and about 2005, and it took 10 more years to integrate them. And so now there's a set of little catchments that are on average three square kilometres in area and two kilometres in length, uh, a, a ne network across the whole nation. There's 102,000 of these in Texas. And using that database, we were able to uh, create a, a simulation model of uh, the whole uh, uh, network, flow network of the country. And yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that picture before, and I had never seen it before. We had a, world, uh, we had a water summit at the White House in March. Uh, this is 2.7 million stream reaches across the nation. This is during uh, May, and our big flooding that happened in May of last year happened right there. Uh, about 50 people were drowned in our state when that happened. And this is now uh, an operational model that covers uh, the whole country. And there's a section of the weather forecasting system uh, in Washington that's now devoted to water, and so water is forecast, and then water is used to drive weather forecasting. Uh, this is a simulation in three hour time steps for three months uh, of last year across uh, the whole continental United States. And uh, what you see here is the similar kind of simulation uh, for, our, for the rivers that flow to the Texas Gulf Coast. So here's uh, May of last year. Uh, the, the big rivers that you see here are the, the Colorado, the Brazos and the Trinity, the Natchez, the Sabine on the east side, and here's the, the big flood in uh, Memorial Day weekend last year that went across our state. So this is something completely new that's never existed before. Uh, water is now being forecast like weather, uh, and uh, it is being forecast with four horizons. The first is called the analysis model, which means a best estimate of the current conditions, what's going on now. The second is a short-range forecast, which is hourly for 15 hours ahead. Um, then is a medium-range forecast, which is three hours for 10 days ahead. Then there's a long-range forecast for 30 days ahead, and that has 16 replicates, so that there's actually a probability distribution of what the long-range forecast will be. All the data are publicly accessible. This is not just hidden within the Weather Service. 
and it became operational as of the 16th of August uh, of this year. And there's just a huge pile of uh, NetCDF files that comes from a, or you can get at a FTP site that you see there, and that's how um, TaxDot and others can get access to the information. If we want to translate flood forecasting of discharge, which is what the National Water Model does, into inundation and uh, elevation, we need floodplain mapping. Uh, our state, after 13 years of FEMA floodplain mapping, is only one half covered, and there are critical areas that have no coverage at all. Uh, Blanco County was where the family from Corpus Christi was in the house, so nine people in the house, and the house was picked up and hit, hit the, the rural Route 12 bridge at uh, Wimberley. Eight of them died. Um, and in Cameron and Hidalgo counties in South Texas, over a million people, just nothing. I mean, this is, we've got to fix this. This is just not right. And so uh, in thinking about how to do that, what I realized was that uh, there's an evolution that's happened here. The National Weather Service uh, up until now has been forecasting uh, water on big basins. The Blanco River at Wimberley is shown on the top picture here. There's a couple of basins and one outlet point, which is at Wimberley itself. Under the new system, that two basins and one outlet point becomes 130 catchments and flow lines that are uniquely labelled. There's a 700 times more dense forecasting system than the current one. And so over the country, the average area of a forecast basin is 400 square miles under the existing system and one square mile under the new system. And so I've been a watershed hydrologist my whole career. I started here at Texas A&M, incidentally, in 1980. I was a visiting assistant professor here. Uh, and what's happened now is the evolution of something that you can call continental hydrology. One huge network, atmosphere to the oceans and coast to coast, like a pipes model under a city. Uh, and this is a, just a basically a new thing, you know, executed using high performance computing. For 2016, to support the Summer Institute, we did a large scale experiment to combine hydrography, which is the blue line description of the stream network, uh, with the elevation data set uh, for 5 million uh, kilometres of stream reaches over the continental US. And we used the CyberGIS computing facility at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign to do that. And we used as a model inundation mapping that the National Weather Service does at 130 locations in the nation, of which 34 are in Texas. And those maps are constructed at the official forecast points that exist now. This one happens to be near the National Water Centre in Alabama, and the little green dot there is a gauging station where, where measurements and forecasts are made. The axis on the left-hand side is the elevation above geodetic datum, and then as the flood rises, the water spreads out, and uh, you get little maps like this. So we took that idea and said, since we're now calculating the flow everywhere in the country, we can do this kind of thing everywhere, not just at the places where there are gauging stations. And in doing that, we decided that we would use a concept like this, which is called the height above nearest drainage, or hand. And it just says, at any location on the land surface, you can measure how high you are above the, the center point of the stream channel. That's height above nearest drainage. And if the water depth in the stream channel is uh, less than that, then you're OK. And if it's greater than that, then, then you get flooded. This is not a, a real complicated concept here. <laughs> but the beauty of simple concepts is that they can be executed at very fine resolution with automation. So we took the NHD Plus data set, which has the catchments and flow lines in the top, and the National Elevation data set, which has a, a mesh of cells, uh, 10 metre intervals across the nation, 180 billion cells, and we calculated for every cell in the landscape what the path was down to the stream and what that vertical difference in elevation was. And then you can just say, oh, OK, if we have an inundation of 15 feet, what's the, what's the map look like? Pfft, you, know, you have it right there. And so if you think about Bernoulli's equation, for those who are into hydraulics, <laughs> I know you're all into hydraulics, uh, the national elevation data set is the brown here, which is the Z term in Bernoulli's equation, and the height above nearest drainage raster is the Y term in the Bernoulli's equation. So we've got two rasters, one on top of the other. And we have computed those using the High Performance Computing Centre um, at the University of Illinois uh, for the whole continental United States. And we've built a continuous foundation for flood inundation mapping for the whole country that has never existed before. If this had been constructed with uh, one reach at a time, doing things, cu cutting cross sections and all that kind of thing, the equivalent cost is $500 a stream mile, and there's 3.2 million miles of streams there. That's $1.6 billion. 
Now you may think, well, $1.6 billion, nobody's going to spend that on flood mapping. We already have. We spent over $2 billion on flood mapping. It's the most expensive civilian mapping program in the world. Now, why $2 billion? Because there's $6 trillion in assets uh, that are insured on the federal flood insurance program. Now, in addition to being able to do inundation, one of the other things that became clear is that we could start calculating reach averaged channel parameters. So normally we would cut cross sections, sometimes we would do this vertically. But what we're doing with uh, height above nearest drainage method is cutting along the stream instead of cutting vertically. And if we take the service area of a reach and divide by the length of the reach, we get something like uh, the top width. If we take the volume of water underneath the surface and divide by the length, we get something like the cross-sectional area. And if we take the wetted area along the bed and divide by the length, we get the wetted perimeter, and that gives all the parameters that we need for hydraulic computations. So this happens to be a, one of the reach catchments, 5781289, that happens to be Eanes Creek in Rollingwood, Texas. I, who, I know some of you are really familiar with Eanes Creek. I hope you are. I used to be the drainage engineer of Rollingwood. Uh, I was the person who permitted new commercial buildings and subdivisions in the city for a few years, and that's what really got me into this GIS stuff. But just for this one creek, this is the city of Rollingwood only cares about this one creek, and they had a deputy who got washed off uh, 2220, uh, sorry, 2244 on BK's Road uh, two years ago trying to put up barriers uh, about 10 o'clock at night, and he almost lost his life. He was, re he was rescued by the Austin Fire Department. His chief went home that night not realising the situation that he left his deputy in. And that's an example of how a first responder's life was put in jeopardy because there wasn't enough uh, capacity to think ahead with respect to the flooding. So if we take the, that particular reach and calculate these tables and graphs uh, like what I was showing, you can get a um, rating curve for the area which relates the discharge to the cross-sectional area and the depth and using Manning's equation, and that's what it looks like for that particular creek. So if we get a forecast from the National Water Model, we can then get an equivalent depth and we can uh, estimate the inundation. Uh, so this means that at the continental scale or at the state scale, we can calculate uh, rating curves for all of these uh, reaches. We can take the forecast discharge from the National Water Model and have the height above the nearest drainage raster and get inundation mapping. And that's what we did in Tuscaloosa uh, last summer. We had a flood emergency response exercise that was uh, held with the fire, police, uh, public works, NGOs and so on in Tuscaloosa County. And this is uh, the Black Warrior River, which is just downstream of Tuscaloosa and under starting to rise, major flooding, starting to recede and returning to normal. And I looked at this and I thought, is that really real? I mean, does water spread out that much? And then these red dots, are the locations of emergency points, address points. This is when you task emergency response vehicles to go to a place. This building, for example, has a dot on it. And when the ambulance gets dispatched here, the dispatcher's looking at the dot, and they're going, go there. There's uh, eight and a half million of these dots in our state and 100 million for the country. And so when you look at this, you see, oh, yeah, nobody lives in there. That's, that's realistic. And the first response people asked about what's going on in, in Moundville. Uh, this little place down the bottom, and uh, why Moundville? Well, bands of the Indians used to live on mounds because it gets flooded all the time. And we just zoomed in there, and they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, that looks right." I mean, so here we we just blew into Tuscaloosa. We had it uncalibrated. I mean, all the wrong, wrong things, and it worked. I mean, and that's pretty amazing when you think about some obscure corner of some randomly chosen county in Alabama. You're doing a continental scale analysis, and it was meaningful to the local first response community without having to spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to get there. This happens to be uh, Rob Robertson. He's the emergency response coordinator for Tuscaloosa County. So we're doing these kind of things now with the city of Austin, detailed flood emergency response planning for local stream reaches, and we're starting a similar thing in Williamson County. And that's under a project which we have in collaboration with the Texas Division of Emergency Management. So the Texas Division of Emergency Management is the state-level organization that corresponds to FEMA at the national level, and the uh, administrator of FEMA, who was one of the people that uh, originally suggested that we do this, um, has asked the TDM to, to, TDM to do a pilot study in Texas of how to do this kind of work uh, that will be a model for the country. So in order to do that, we've calculated uh, 98,000 reaches. We've calculated the rating curves. And we've, uh, this is for 190,000 miles of rivers uh, in our state. So real-time flood inundation mapping is possible for all of Texas. Now, of course, 
Now, here we are in a tech start meeting. Why am I here? Well, this is obviously, this has impact on the road system. It has impact on the bridge system. Right, you've got a huge network here across the, the state. Basically, the state is now one complete single entity, uh, and the, it, the interaction of the flooding and the road system and the bridge system can be systematically examined. Uh, one of the things, I watched all these lovely pictures of bridges that you've just seen, and I was thinking to myself, how many sensors did those bridges have on them to measure the water level underneath? So obviously if we're going to forecast so many things in much more detail than we've had in the past, we need to be measuring things much more detail than we have in the past. And these are new radar measurements uh, that just measuring water level, the instrument costs about $5,000 and if you want to measure velocity as well, uh, surface velocity, it costs $12,000 and you can, uh, these uh, packaged up instruments, they can just be attached to a bridge and that they are driven by uh, solar power and communicate through cell phone technology. This is a very low cost, self-contained system that doesn't require a lot of field maintenance to keep it going. Uh, in our state, we have 550 USGS stream gauges, the gold standard of measurement of all, for water of all kinds of purposes. We have 54,000 textile bridges. So for every stream gauge, there's 100 bridges. So this is clearly the bridge network of the state could be considered a sensor platform or a network of sensor platforms and we could by using it augment the 550 gauges that we have now that are maintained by the USGS with measurements of water level and surface velocity or maybe just of water level uh, and we're calculating the flow on and the level on 102,000 reaches in the state so that currently we are measuring one for every 185 that we calculate. Um, in Iowa, the students at the University of Iowa have invented a flood sensor like what you just saw with radar, and the University of Iowa has deployed these uh, over the state. So there's 237 USGS stream gauges in Iowa and 224 sensors put out by the Iowa Flood Center. So in other words, these water level measurements are as dense as what the USGS gauging system is. So let's think about what we could do here in Texas. Uh, we've got 54,000 bridges and 550 USGS gauges. If we instrumented one bridge in 100, uh, we would double the number of points that we touch the water in our state. If we instrumented two bridges in 100, we would triple the number of <laughs> places that we touch the water in the state. And so this is something that I would like to ask you to think about and because this, is a, this will be a very significant increase in the fidelity of the forecasting system that has emerged. So just to summarise, water is now forecast like weather, 98,000 reaches on 190,000 miles uh, streams and rivers in, the, in our state. That's transformative for Texas. You know what a problem flooding is for our state and the continual issues that we have with that. I'm asking, could TxDOT adopt the policy of putting a water level sensor on a bridge as a standard piece of equipment? I mean, I looked at all these beautiful bridges and I was thinking, our sensors cost nothing compared with all that. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Can flood impact on roads and bridges be forecast statewide? And I, the answer to that question is yes, it can. And we need to work through that. <coughs> and so my last question is, can we collaborate with TxDOT to improve flood resilience in our state? Thank you. <laughs>